All right, good afternoon. My name is Carrie McDermott, and I am the Communications Director with the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network. Uh, I see we still have attendees joining. Um, if you're on the line today, you have joined us for the um, 2 p.m. Central webinar called Cleaning is More Than a Swiffer and Mr. Clean. And again, my name is Carrie McDermott. I am the Communications Director here at Great Plains Clean. We are the Quality Innovation Network quality improvement organization for both North and South Dakota. And we're bringing this webinar to you today in partnership with the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care. Before we begin, I'll go over a few housekeeping issues. Um, today's webinar is being recorded. We will post it to the Great Plains Quinn website within one to two business days, along with um, the presentation that's shared with you today. All lines are muted throughout this presentation. We will open it up for Q&A after uh, the session concludes. And questions and comments can be shared with presenters through the questions panel on your GoToWebinar dashboard. On the right of your screen, you should see a questions tab. You can click on that and pose any questions for our speakers, and we will address them at the end of the um, formal presentation. And we have added a few resources and handouts um, to this webinar in the GoToWebinar dashboard as well. You'll see that under the tab handouts. Um, thank you again for joining our webinar today, Project First Line, Cleaning is More Than a Swiffer and Mr. Clean. This webinar aims to emphasize the importance of adhering to the basics of environmental cleaning and disinfection to promote patient and resident safety, staff wellness, and reduce healthcare acquired infections. There are four objectives for today's session. Um, the first is to differentiate between cleaning and disinfecting. Two, to understand contact time and high contact or high touch surfaces. And three, apply strategies and tips to support cleaning and disinfection compliance in our healthcare environments. And the fourth is to learn more about the project first line trainings nationally and state based. So we are fortunate to have representation for project first line in both of the Dakotas. Sherry Fast is the program manager for, the, for um, South Dakota, and Nicole Galler is the lead in North Dakota. Sherry will be our featured presenter today, but we will have the opportunity to hear from Nicole on North Dakota's efforts as well. So now I'll formally introduce both speakers, starting with Nicole. Nicole has worked with the CDC Foundation as an epidemiologist and has been remotely stationed with North Dakota Department of Health since October of last year. In her time with the health department, she has worked on COVID long-term care and hospitalization data and is the coordinator for the North Dakota Department of Public Health. Um, she is currently the coordinator for the Project First Line Initiative in North Dakota. She has a master's of public health and is currently pursuing a doctorate of public health, concentrating on health services management and policy. Sherry Fast is currently um, working in healthcare for over 30 years. She is creative and passionate. She has worked with facilities, healthcare providers, community leaders, and patients on multiple healthcare initiatives, including antibiotic stewardship. She recently obtained her certification in infection control. And as I mentioned, she is currently the lead for the Project First Line Initiative in South Dakota. She is anxious to work with facilities and frontline healthcare workers on infection prevention measures to keep us all safe. And now, Sherry, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us today. I will turn it over to you to begin the presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm so um, honored to have Nicole here with me as well from North Dakota to share what's um, going on in North Dakota in Project First Line. So we have a lot to cover today. And so I think we'll just get right into it. If I can advance my slides here, there we go. Uh, Carrie went through the objective, so we're gonna bypass that one, but they're there for your reference. And so we can't talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, infection control without talking about the chain of infection. And that's important to review that. So um, this one chart that I have on here is from APIC, but there's many different ones out there. The environment of care is one of the most important aspects in reducing the transmission of infections. 
The first stage is always the agent. So what is it? Is it bacteria, fungi? Is it a virus? Is it a parasite that we have that we're watching? Um, stage two is our reservoir. So where's that germ living? Is it people? Is it dirty surfaces? Is it soil? It might be insects, it could be water, it could be dirty equipment. So lots of places that, you know, these bacteria and viruses can live. Then we go to our stage three, which is our exit. So how does that get out? Is it by aerosol? Maybe it's splashing or splattering. Um, maybe it's <clears throat> from an open wound that we have in our hand. Transmission is the next stage. Um, this can be direct or indirect. And we can get that by maybe breathing. Um, maybe we breathe in um, or we ingest something like E. coli. Now, I, so I know that sounds awful, but we touch a surface that has E. coli on it, and then we eat something with our hands. We've just ingested E. coli. Uh, stage five is a portal of entry, so we need a way for that bacteria to get in um, to the host. And so that whether that be our skin, our respiratory tract, maybe, maybe it's a catheter, maybe it's a tube, maybe it's a call light that fell on the floor. Um, so just a variety of ways that those pathogens can enter our system. And then we always have to think about our susceptible host. And that's really anyone, um, but we're worried most about those that are receiving health care because their immune system is down for some reason anyway. So when one, or, when one of these links is broken, that's when infection occurs. It's important to find the right tool for your staff so they can understand it. The first one I showed you from APEC, it's very busy, so that might not be the best tool to share with somebody that's not um, like maybe a nurse or a physician. This one maybe is um, better received by dietary department or your housekeeping services. So you need to find what is gonna resonate with them. Um, and I think that's an important tool. And Post different ones throughout, you know, the year or, or throughout your facility. So, what is the weakest link when it comes to infection control, and do we know what that is? And I guess I was, would be curious to know how many people remember the TV show The Weakest Link. I could not help myself think about how infections occur without going back to that chain of infection, and when you think about that actual chain and your weak links. So I hope that you remember, if nothing else today, that you've got to find that weak link in your chain. And what can we do to control that? So do you know what your weak link is? That's the other thing. Is it compliance? Is it behavior? Is it you don't have enough time? Is it knowledge? Maybe your staff don't know. So is it a policy that maybe needs revision? So many, many different things to think about in how that link gets broken. And how can we fix that link? So we don't want to have links that are as fragile as that paper clip, like showing in the slide. Um, we want it to. We want our links to be strong, so that you have to have a side cutter to get them to break them. And it's very true. You know, we're only as strong as our weakest link. So we need to find that. And <clears throat> I guess I want to just say also, you don't know what's going out on the floor in the units unless you're there. So you need to do some audits. Maybe you have somebody like a secret shopper that's out there looking and watching. And is everybody doing hand hygiene? Um, I think that's important. We can't see germs, not very often anyway. So we need to make sure that we're doing a good job about being on, a, on that. Um, it's critical uh, to maintain um, proper knowledge and resources. And if you remember that show, The Weakest Link, this is a picture of the host of that show. And when she, and when the contestant um, was the weak link, she would say, you are the weakest link, goodbye. And I, I think that's kind of uh, funny actually, because wouldn't that be nice if we could do that in infection control, identify that link and just say goodbye and have it be done. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen. So 
It's critical to maintain our proper knowledge and resources to interrupt that mode of transmission. And this can be done through cleaning, disinfection, sterilization, and knowing infection control standards. So we're gonna get into now the difference between cleaning and disinfection. And they're different. They are not the same thing. Cleaning is the removal of foreign material, whether that's soil, dust, organic material from objects, and it's normally done with water and detergent. Disinfection is the elimination of the, of the organism, except for bacterial spores. Those have to be um, sterilized to get rid of spores, and spores are like our C. difficile. So disinfection occurs after cleaning. So we have to clean before we can disinfect. If you jump right into disinfection, you might miss a lot of debris that's left behind. Many instruments might need friction to get all those particles away. As you can see in the slide, I have a picture of a scissors. There's a lot of stuff left behind in there. This actually looks like there's a little bit of rust on this um, scissors. And if anybody um, is soaking instruments in normal saline, that's a no-no. That's very corrosive and it's not a cleaning agent. So don't be using normal saline to <coughs> soak your instruments. Um, the disinfection cannot occur until proper cleaning um, is done. So I wanted to throw this slide in because it's very important to know um, how long bacteria lives. And so the, the coronavirus, as we're very well aware, can survive on many different surfaces, including metal and plastic. Um, Studies show that surface contamination can uh, um, persist for days. Frequent contact between infectious page patients and contaminated surfaces um, contribute to the transmission of healthcare um, infections, as we all know. So I want to um, talk about porous. So it, how long the coronavirus stays on your surface? It depends on different factors. One is how porous is that surface that you're looking, but it also is about humidity and temperature um, and dust. They all can contribute to the time that a virus is um, viable. So if you look at this, we have, like I said, other infection or bacteria that we need to think about. Staph aureus, including MRSA. Look at how long that lives, seven days to 12 months, so one year. Um, Enterococcus can live on surfaces for five days to 46 months. Um, C. difficile, over five months. So even if we do a, you know, a good job of cleaning, we might leave something behind. Norovirus can live for eight hours to two weeks. Pseudomonas, six hours to 16 months. And then Klebsiella uh, for two hours to 30 months. So just want to think about those kinds of things that it's not all about um, COVID-19. Okay, here's another slide, bed bugs. Tend not to think about bed bugs too much, but I want to just take a moment to um, let you know this is an infection problem and we need to think about this. We have infested patients, visitors, healthcare providers, they can bring bed bugs into our facilities on their clothes, on their personal belongings, in their purses, on their computers. They can be on the wheelchairs or walkers. And bed bugs can survive for a year without being fed. So that's a long time. They can hide in um, linen. They can live in bed frames. They can live on chairs and tables behind picture frames. They can be behind the wallpaper. They can live in carpeting. So just something to think about. So if you do find a bed bug, you obviously need to um, get that linen in a plastic bag and tie it shut, um, remove any clutter from the room, and then do a really good job of cleaning. If you vacuum, um, your vacuum should have a HEPA filter in it as well to get rid of those bed bugs. <clears throat> um, before cleaning, <clears throat> I really encourage anyone to do an inspection of the room. So if I walk by a room and I know I'm gonna go in there and clean, think about what do I have, what do I need? If the room looks just 
filthy dirty, you might want to take extra supplies in with you. Um, CDC recommends that we always clean um, cleanest to dirtiest. So we want to do those outside walls first, working our way inside to the patient bed. Um, and then we want to work top to bottom. So the higher the surface, we want to do those first. So any particles that are up high or dust bunnies, they'll fall to the floor and we can get them last. Um, that's an important thing <clears throat> to remember. Um, even when we're um, cleaning at home, the, some of these principles um, apply to home as well. So some of them are basic. Some of you, I'm sure, do a fantastic job about that, but sometimes we just get busy and we need a good review of these practices. So cleaning schedules and procedures, um, like I said, go from least soiled to the most soiled areas. And then we wanna think about, as an example, if we're cleaning the bed, the bed rails before the bed legs, top to bottom. We wanna clean the surface before the floor. So just some basic principles to, um, to do when you're cleaning. The other important thing is we wanna ensure that all the surfaces are reached and Cleaning should be done in a systematic manner. So everyone in the facility should be cleaning basically the same way. I, if I come in as an observer, I should be able to watch, you know, three people clean basically the same way. And that's important because if I'm just willy nillying around the room cleaning what I want, I may forget something. I may get called away and then I don't know where I left off. So very important principle to, to do. Now, the CDC also has, and APIC also has um, measures that even how to clean your cloth, how to fold it up. So if you have a, a cleaning cloth that you're using, you wanna fold that in half, so it's about the size of your hand, um, and then you fold it in half again, and then a half again. So you should have eight sides to your cloth. And so when one side gets dirty, you, fold, you change that so you have a clean side exposed. Again, clean to dirty, high to low. Do it in a systematic way. Make sure your surfaces stay wet for the allotted contact time. That's very important and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, when all eight sides of your cloth are used, you get a clean towel. So don't just bunch it up like in a ball and, and, and wipe. Um, there's a system that you can think about it when you're cleaning. So do not re-wet that same cloth in the solution either. You need a clean one. When you've used all eight sides, get a new one. Now, when it comes to um, mopping the floor, CDC recommends that you change your solution um, every 60 minutes or every three rooms. Uh, we wanna use Used mops and cleaning cloths should never be returned to the containers. They should be laundered or discarded after use. A disinfectant must be used to clean the rooms in critical areas, so like in your isolation rooms. And then you never wanna leave your mop heads or your cleaning cloths soaking in buckets. You wanna use a figure eight um, pattern when you're cleaning, um, as shown in the picture there. Um, here we're talking about some more mopping guidelines. Um, you want to wring out your mop after you wet it. Figure eight pattern with overlapping strokes. You want to turn your mop head frequently. And I know these seem like basic things, but they're very important in reducing the spread of infections. After cleaning a small area, you put the mop um, back in the bucket, rinse water, and wring it out. Repeat that. You always want, when you're mopping a room, you want to start at the farthest point and work toward the exit. And then change after every isolation room that, that you are cleaning. Um, <clears throat> we've kind of already talked about this, but again, um, I'm telling you again because it's important. Cleaning proceeds high to low. You want that dust to fall to the floor so you can clean it when you're doing the floor. Um, dusting contains fungal spores like aspergillus. And so we don't want that. Um, we don't want a patient that's susceptible to breathe that, that in. 
And so that's why that's important. Use a cloth or a dust mop that's um, treated with a chemical or um, made of microfiber and that will help that. No longer do we use um, um, feather dusting. If you have those, you should get rid of those. Um, okay, bathrooms. We have a lot to go through in the next few slides. Bathrooms must be cleaned and disinfected at least daily and when visibly soiled. During C. difficile and other times when you have diarrhea, uh, you want to clean at least three times a day. The toilet seat, the flusher handle, the faucet handles, handrails, soap dispensers, the call light, um, the bedpan dispenser, the light switch, all of those are considered high touch surfaces and they need to be um, um, cleaned three times a day at least. Um, when you have an outbreak. If a patient has a bedside commode, it must be cleaned and disinfected at least daily and when visibly soiled. When that patient no longer needs that commode, that commode must be cleaned and decontaminated before you move it out of the room. Um, this slide, we're going to talk a little bit about alcohol-based hand rub. Obviously, that's um, something we want everyone to be using. The one exception is when you um, when your hands are visibly soiled, before you eat, and after you use the restroom, we want you to use soap and water. We want you to wash your hands. There's some regulations um, as far as where you have your dispensers with alcohol-based hand rubs, um, and they they're pretty strict on the placement of those. So the corridor um, where you have those in the hallways must be at least six feet wide. The dispensers have to be four feet apart and they can't be installed um, less than six inches adjacent to an electrical outlet or a switch. So something to think about. If they're mounted over carpet, you have to have sprinklers and smoke alarms. So just some things to think about. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about um, EVS staff and the cleaning carts. So <clears throat> our environmental service staff often use portable carts to transport their supplies. So their clean items like toilet paper and paper towels should be stored above the cleaning chemicals. If you have soil dusters or mops, those should be placed in a plastic bag and stored away from the cleaner items. Um, as you can see in the picture here, often the bag is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, hung on the side of the cart for the transport. Our mop handles and wet floor signs, those all need to be cleaned with a disinfectant before you put them back on the cart. The carts themselves need to be cleaned. And again, we don't want any personal items like purses or snacks or drinks in the cart or on the cart. I think um, sometimes that happens. Um, and I know that staff get busy and they, they're thirsty, but please do not put that on the cards. Operating rooms. Um, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about this because it's important. I don't know if we have any attendees that work in surgery department, but um, important for us all to know this as well. Uh, the operating room suite should have a dedicated cleaning tools. So carts, buckets, mops, dusting poles, vacuums, floor machines um, to prevent aeros aerosolization of chemicals. The EV EVS staff should wipe surfaces with disinfectant saturated wipes or microfiber cloths instead of spray bottles of disinfectants. Because blood and body fluids are common in the OR, EVS staff should use disinfectants that are EPA registered as effective against um, hepatitis B and HIV. Sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach, is not recommended for routine use because it can cause pitting of some of the surfaces. Alcohol is not recommended for damp dusting large surfaces because it dries too quickly. Um, there are three distinct times 
for cleaning the floors, um, for cleaning operating rooms before the first case of the day, between cases, and at the end of the day. Before the first case of the day, um, the horizontal surface in the operating room should be damp dusted. Um, and this can be done by the nursing staff as well. <clears throat> Floors in the operating room are another area. They, can, they must be cleaned and disinfected after each case. So hopefully that's all being done. A clean mop head and a fresh disinfectant solution uh, must be used for each case. It is only necessary to clean a three to four foot perimeter around the table, the operating table for each case, unless you know you have a, a big spill or something like that, but you don't have to really do the whole room, but you have to do it around the table. So important um, things to consider for the operating room. And then we have outpatient settings. They're really um, geared just like inpatient um, areas. So again, high touch surfaces in the patient zone, which is the exam room, the procedure rooms, waiting areas, they must be cleaned and disinfected with a EPA registered product. And that's pretty um, common for all, all settings. The floors there need to be cleaned with a detergent instead of a disinfectant, unless it's contaminated. Um, let's see, carpets should be done daily. Waste should be collected daily. Um, and because there is significantly less biohazard um, waste in the outpatient setting, facilities may have one large biohazard container in a central location. Um, well, let's see, it's a lot to go over. I put this in here so that um, one of the things I learned in studying for my test is, is in cleaning outpatient areas or exam rooms, you should never store any of your supplies in these three drawers at the end of the table. And you think about that, it only makes sense. We have people that are up in stirrups or doing exams. Um, we might get um, you know, discharge or fluids that leak onto that or drop down. So if you, if you have storage um, in these three drawers, I'd highly recommend getting rid of those and put them someplace else. Always wanna use new paper um, on the exam tables as well between patients and disinfect. So now we're gonna talk about contact time. Um, we've all heard a lot about contact time. We try to hurry it along and that's not something that we should be doing. Um, contact time is the time the disinfectant must be in contact with the surface to ensure that the appropriate disinfection has occurred. The surface should remain wet for the required contact time. That's important. Um, don't try to hurry that dry time along. Don't dry the surface with a towel. Don't use a fan. Don't blow on it. Um, if your product has a long contact time, you may wanna consider getting something with a shorter kill time. There are a lot of products out there that just have a two to three minute contact time. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is to do a time test. So spray your surface with your product and then time how long it takes it to dry. You may have to respray um, your surface or re-wet it. So you want it to be pretty wet. I've had people tell me that they're only using one or two wipes for an entire room. Well, those wipes are probably dry before, um, before they're really getting um, the correct kill time. So make sure that that is getting done appropriately. I know that people um, in the middle of COVID, you know, when supplies were short, people were worried they would run out of supplies, but that should not be happening any longer. And if that is, then um, please get a hold of me and we'll try to figure out something for you. Contact time, also known as dwell time or wet, wet time, kill time. We're gonna go through a few cleaning precautions. I don't know how I'm doing for time. 2.30. Okay, um, <clears throat> so how often should I clean? That's a question that um, everybody wants to know and it depends on a variety of issues. So it depends on the probability of contamination. It depends on the vulnerability of your patients and it, it 
it depends on um, the potential for exposure. So how many high touch surface areas do you have there? And then you can do a risk assessment for your facility. I put the link on the slide here. We don't have time to go through it. And I'm just gonna um, show you uh, a couple things regarding that. But um, in regards to cleaning precautions, you know, if you have a solution, you don't wanna top it off with anything, don't add, add anything. So if you have alcohol-based hand sanitizer and they're in um, those um, containers that are mounted on the wall where you squeeze them to get your um, solution out, once those are empty, you should put a new one in. So don't top them off. Don't top off cleaning um, solutions either. Um, I had one, so I did, and I'll get into this a little bit later. I had one facility, um, I went and did some focus sessions with a few facilities and uh, followed some of the environmental services staff. And um, one lady, she could not stand the smell of their cleaning supplies. And so she would add her own stuff to her solution. And I, you know, so we talked that through and she says she just doesn't like the smell of it. So don't be adding anything to the solutions either. So. Um, this is one of, this is part of that risk assessment that you can download from the CDC and it looks busy and I just did some screenshots here. So just kind of tells you um, how to do that. So categorize the risk assessment that determines your need. So it talks about is your space heavily contaminated with pathogens and you get a score. Um, so that's how that's based on. And you can just look that up. Here's another one. So it shows you general outpatient. It tells you cleaning, like how often you should terminally clean or routine clean. We'll go through these pretty quickly here. Um, talks about toilets. It talks about blood spills and how to do that. Talks about your waiting room. So you can just go through those. These are all the different areas. And I just like I said, screenshotted some of them. So we have sterile services, ICU, labor and delivery, dialysis, our emergency department. So I encourage you to look through those. Whoops. <clears throat> um, always follow your manufacturer directions and precautions on all your cleaning and disinfection products. And you'll wanna, um, if you're concerned or don't know, um, go to the list N. Um, that's with the Environmental um, Protection Agency, and they have a list of everything that you need. It shows you how to find those. So you find your registration number on the label. And I put the link down there as well. I know there is a lot of questions on that, but please feel free to use that. And if you have questions, let me know. Always follow your cleaning um, um, protocols by your employer in your facility, that's important. Going to talk on high touch surfaces. So these are surfaces that are found in um, areas that, um, in healthcare, basically. So what, what kinds of things are considered high touch? So most common pathogens are MRSA and C. difficile and they're found on the floors. So we don't want to store items on the floor if we can help it. Um, high touch surfaces, our remote controls, our light switches, the call light, the door handles. We're going to go through quite a few more of those, but I just wanted to make sure that we got that in because anything that's used a lot, that a lot of hands touch, whether that be patients or yourself, um, are a risk for infections. And this is just a question I was visiting with Lori about, um, you know, what do you do when the call light falls on the floor? Do you just pick it up and give it back to the resident or the patient, or do you wipe it off? You know, I don't know that I have the answer for all of this, but I think it's important for you to think through this process. So if, if you have access to have a wipe, I would certainly wipe that call light off before I give it back to the patient or put it on their bed. Just some things to think about. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. If you can put that in the chat on what do you do? Um, I think that's an important thing to discuss and, and really consider. 
Some other high touch areas, um, door knobs, overbed tables, bed rails, IV poles, toilet and sink handles, counters, privacy curtains, um, monitoring equipment, transport equipment, call bells, telephones, all of those things, high touch surfaces, high risk for transmission of infections. Uh, this just shows um, in a patient room, some of those high touch surfaces. The second picture here, and I have the references there, um, was from a hospital in Minnesota where they cultured some different sites in a in one of their hospital rooms and all these places with X's had contamination after cleaning. So we wanna make sure that we have all our materials, all our supplies that we need when we go into a room to clean. Um, we need to think about it and think, what do I have? And try to have plenty of those when you go into the room. So I'm gonna go through a few other things here. Um, if you um, are a nursing home or an assisted living or um, you pass ice to your residents or your patients, a lot of um, facilities are using these coolers, which are which are great, um, but just make sure they're lined with a, a liner in them. Don't s store your metal scoop in the ice. Um, metal scoop is preferred over plastic. And then when you clean, always make sure that you clean and disinfect the cooler between uses. It should be dried um, and you don't wanna store anything in that because we can get water bugs and we'll talk about water bugs in a minute, but things like aspergillus and pneumonia can grow in there. So just some things to think about. Laundry, um, make sure that we're using rubber, gro rubber gloves when you're handling laundry, laundry, but if you're just cleaning a bed and you've got some soiled, um, you know, sheets or maybe the patient gown, Try to not hold that against your body. Roll it up and do not shake it. We don't want it on our clothes. Um, don't take linen out of patient rooms without it being contained in a bag. Uh, soiled bags can be laundered with their dirty linen in it. Uh, if you have you know, feces or vomit on them, you wanna remove as much of that as you can. So some of these, again, basic principles. Um, but just wanted to review. Keep your laundry carts covered all the time. Um, wanted just to, I guess, bring this attention attention um, to this area. So we have rehab rooms, therapy rooms. How are those um, machines and stairs getting disinfected? This facility, they Velcroed um, their sanity wipes to their machine and um, I think that's a really good idea because if they don't see it, they're not going to, typically you won't clean them. So this makes it visual for them. Um, floors, again, these steps, these therapy steps, how many people are walking up and down on them and through the floor. And so make sure those are cleaned in between resident uses. Um, closets <clears throat> are an important part in cleaning and disinfection. So OSHA recommends that you have 18 inches from your ceiling if you have a sprinkler head so that there is an even distribution should there be a fire. If you do not have a sprinkler system, um, you can have your things stored five inches from the ceiling. Um, you wanna make sure that your shelves are eight inches from the floor and two inches from the wall. You want sturdy shelves. And you can see in this picture, um, here 18 inches from the top of that shelf. So hopefully everybody's clean utility rooms look like this. Um, I did some searching and when I was studying uh, for my test, there were some facilities I seen that drew a line above their cart like this and painted on painted this line. So everybody knew there was no storage above that line. Now this picture shows some problems um, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Again, they've got storage up here. If you can see my cursor above their storage line, which we do not want. They have cardboard boxes um, 
in there, which we do not want. So no cardboard um, containers. Storage in any cardboard is discouraged. And we don't think about that, but super important because little bugs from the shipping yards or wherever, um, we don't know where these boxes came from, how long they've been in the trucks. And uh, little bugs can get in these crevices here. And so we don't want that. All our supplies um, should be stored in plastic washable containers. So think about this corrugated cardboard there and how many little nasty bugs could get in there. Again, this picture on the top shows the boxes being stored way up as high to the ceiling. So really um, try to get rid of that if you can. Then we have to think about shower and tub rooms. How are those cleaned? Um, we need to think, um, We've so we've done a great job making our resident feel great or our patient. So we don't wanna make them sick now. And there's several bacteria that really like water. They are Pseudomonas, Legionella, and Mycobacteria. So Pseudomonas is important because it can cause 60% of healthcare acquired infections um, or pneumonia that causes, um, that can cause pneumonia. So this is important as long, in long-term care as well. So Pseudomonas is a negative, um, gram-negative bacilli and they're modal, so they're able to move around. They're aerobic and they are found in mo moist environments. So whenever a moist environment is present, you might wanna consider Pseudomonas. You want to pay attention to our shower heads when you're cleaning as well and don't just do the walls. Some more things with water bugs um, that I want to point out. One way we can prevent um, Pseudomonas and Legionella is to control the water temperature in the facilities. Water bugs, as they're called, um, can cause disease indirectly by inhaling aerosols through the shower. Um, through the construction process, through faucets and sinks. You might find water bugs in ice machines, multi-dose vials, flowers, and even tap water. You might wonder why I have the tomato in this picture. Tomatoes have been linked to Pseudomonas. Pseudomonas so if you see a tomato with these spots, you may not want to eat that one. Uh, CDC recommends water temperatures to be 105 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit to kill Legionella. Um, and there's kind of a little bit of um, controversy with this because Legionella really needs to be, uh, the temp needs to be 124 degrees to kill Legionella, but a lot of states, uh, their max temp is 120. So, um, you know, get it as high as you can to that 120 especially if you have an older building. Um, let's see. Another way you can um, help ward off Legionella is to cap off dead ends, dead legs in plumbing. And so this bottom picture, you can see this extra pipe. So this pipe to the kitchens, that's where the really the, the water supply ends. And we have all this extra pipe here. Well, what happens is, um, we get biofilm in there, and so we want to cap that off if we can. I, I know we have a lot of older facilities, but that's something that we really need to think about um, in there. Also, um, if you have waterfalls and pretties in your facilities, I hope that's on a disinfection schedule and you're really checking that because that's something to um, have stagnant water as well. Talking about um, patient care items, you know, it's good practice. Everybody have their own personal care items, their nail clippers, their comb, their scissors. Um, there's a lot of talk right now on um, how to disinfect, you know, nail clippers if you share them between residents. It's just good practice that everybody has their own. You can clean them, but um, I don't, advise cleaning and soaking overnight. That's very hard on your instruments. APIC just came out with um, a new guideline, a new um, issue brief, and I have that in the handout that is well worth a read. And it talks about um, non-critical medical devices and how we sterilize them. 
I don't think we have time to get into all of that today. So I highly encourage you to download those um, resources and look at those. Um, getting close to the end here. So what do I put on first? This is just good prevention. We want to put our gown on first, then our mask and make sure it fits around our nose, then our face shield, and then our gloves. And what do I take off first? Gloves. Gloves are the dirtiest. They come off first. Make sure you're doing proper glove removal as shown in the pictures here. And then we, so we do our gloves, then we have our face shield, then we have our gown, then we have, um, and we're rolling our gown towards us. Then we wash our hands, remove our mask, and wash our hands again. So take some time to think about that and show your staff or do those things. So now I'm going to talk just briefly about Project First Line. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Project First Line is um, an exciting project um, from the CDC, and it's a national training initiative that's being rolled out across the nation, and it's to help stop the spread of infectious diseases, including COVID-19. And it is geared toward frontline workers to give them a basic foundational understanding of infection control practices. In South Dakota, we did a learning needs assessment. Um, we got 1,900 responses back. We divided our, juris our um, facilities up into jurisdictions and you can read there. I'm gonna go through this pretty fast because I wanna give Nicole time um, to talk about what's going on in North Dakota. Um, but you can see those are the jurisdictions. Um, uh, let's see. Our learning needs assessment or our project first line is in, we have three phases of that. So we did our learning needs assessment. Then we went and we listened to um, different facilities, followed in EVS um, around, um, really wanted to hone in on what's really important. And now we are in the education phase. In our survey, we found that um, implementing infection control uh, with vulnerable populations, strategies for putting infection control into place and cleaning and disinfection were some of the top things that people responded with that they wanted training in. And so that's kind of where today's topic came in. And um, we just received notice that Project First Line will be refunded. And so we'll be able to continue education and training for the next couple of years. So we're excited about that. In South Dakota, we have Project First Line. We have a website. And so feel free to go on there and look at that. We created a video just to introduce it. Um, we'll probably be doing some more of videos like that. This features some South Dakota healthcare workers. Um, you know, and I wanna say, when you, if you're teaching strategies or getting, um, boring for your um, staff, consider doing a quick little video like that. We learned in our survey that you have about five minutes of good teaching time. So um, Project First Line, we have seven training sessions. We have all seven modules are on our website, which is SouthDakotaProjectFirstLine.org. You can earn a certificate of attendance, or you can also get a CE credit. Um, we have been approved from the South Dakota Emergency Management Program to give 30 minutes of continuing education credit. So um, it's a real quick process. You just have to put your email in and then it can take you to the training. If you do want to get a CE, there is a couple short questions on a survey monkey, and then it'll take you to your certificate page. Uh, remember, we can do customized education for facilities. We can come in and um, help you out. These trainings can be short. They can be 10 minutes or up to an hour. Here's some of the graphics that are on um, Project First Line that you can download. We we'll also have a resource page on our website and um, we'll be adding more to that all the time. These are some of the videos. I think there's 20 six or seven videos now. You can follow Project First Line on Twitter and Instagram as well. 
And now I'm gonna turn it over to Nicole so she has some time to talk. Thank you, Sherry. Wow, what an informative presentation. I know I have personally learned a lot. Um, so my name is Nicole Galler, and I'm here to just tell you a little bit about what we're doing in North Dakota for Project First Line. As Sherry has done a great job at talking about, you know, Project First Line is a national training collaborative. And here at North Dakota Department of Health, we're really excited to bring infection prevention and control trainings. And the training events that we offer are free and they're designed for you to be able to learn practical ways to keep germs from spreading in your workplace, keeping you and everyone around you safer and healthier. So what can NDDOH Project First Line offer you? We have free live IPC training events, recordings of past training events on our website, as well as um, resources on our website. And we also offer the opportunity to earn CEU through North Dakota Board of Nursing. In fact, we actually have one live go-to webinar training left in our most recent series. Um, that one is gonna be PPE part two, gowns and gloves, and it is a 30 minute training session. And that's gonna be on Tuesday, December 14th. Um, you can sign up for that on our website. If you missed any trainings leading up to this, you can check out recordings of our past training on our website as well, and CEU credits are still available. Um, we plan to roll out additional training soon, including topics on respirator, source control, ventilation, cleaning, and disinfection, as well as asymptomatic spread. So email us at dohpfl at nd.gov if you would like to receive any updates on new trainings or if you have any questions for us. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell you um, a little bit about what we're doing at NDDOH Project First Line, and we hope to hear from you. Thank you, Nicole. Um, and so we'll just leave a couple minutes um, for questions if anyone has any. Um, you know, just in ending, I want to say that we need to work together. We can draw on everybody's strengths. Um, we don't want to be that weak link. Um, we can do this. Um, we find those weak links. We can be better prepared and we'll keep our patients, our coworkers, and ourselves safer. So, was there any questions or? This is Carrie with Great Plains Quinn. And again, if anybody has any questions, you can add them into the questions um, panel on your dashboard, or you can click on your name in the attendees panel and raise your hand. And I do have one individual that raised their hand. I always wanna just double check to make sure it's not by accident. Um, it's Carmen Augustine. Carmen, I'm gonna unmute your line. And if that's a mistake on your end, you can let me know, or I will mute you again. Here, I'll I don't think I can unmute her, so. She might, I think she did that by mistake would be my guess. So if you have a question, you can put it in the question panel or raise your hand um, in that dashboard and I will um, unmute your line and you can ask a question. Um, I do have a couple questions for you, Sherry, that came through. You had mentioned EPA registered products to help measure con contact time and wet time, is are those uh, resources and products on that CDC site that you provided the link to um, earlier in your presentation? Um, I'm not sure, but we can certainly get those on. You can go to the national CDC website. There is a link there and I can put that in, get that for, for you as well okay. to make it easy. Okay, excellent. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions. Um, when an organization identifies their weakest link, whether it's compliance or behavior, lack of time or lack of knowledge, what's your what's your suggestion on where to get started? Who do you involve um, and how do you share that information with the rest of your team um, to, to make improvement? You know, I would say that um, you need to get out there on the floors and see what's going on. Like I, I think I said this earlier, um, if you can identify a champion on the floor, so whether that be a CNA, a nurse that's kind of overseeing, and we have to hold each other accountable for mm -hmm. this. And I think that's really important, but yeah, we have to review our policies. Are they, are they what people are doing? You know, maybe it's, maybe it's an obsolete policy and um, 
you know, we have managers that want to do the right thing, but maybe things are outdated. And so the people actually working on the floor, they know what products they're using. They know how it's actually being done. So I think it's important that we would have an EVS person on our quality team. I think that is something that's um, probably not done enough. Does that answer your question? <laughs> no, that was excellent. Yes, I would. I, um, I believe so. Uh, I'm not seeing any other questions in the panel other than will the PowerPoint be sent out to attendees? And the answer to that is yes. Um, we will share uh, the recording of today's session, including the PowerPoint with all attendees of today's event. Um, again, I'm gonna look one more time to make sure I'm not missing anybody with a raised hand. I'm not seeing any. Um, so I just want to thank you, Sherry, for sharing <laughs> this information with us today. I think it's so imperative. I almost thought about canceling my plans tonight to go to dinner with friends so I can clean my own house. Um, this was pretty eye-opening for me. Um, again, everyone... You know, I got to I gotta just... Can I just say one thing before I close okay. here, I guess? Of course. So I recently was... I was recently out to dinner and... Um, it was kind of a slow time. It was like four o'clock in the afternoon and they were cleaning their, um, this was at a little bar restaurant. They were cleaning because there wasn't many people in there and the people cleaning were cleaning the glasses and all of that dust was falling onto the counters. Mm -hmm. onto the, yeah. And I was like, oh, they probably don't know I'm in infection control, <laughs> but you know, I think they probably did it because there wasn't, you know, a lot of people in the in the facility at the time. But just think about that. They never did go back and wipe off the counters after they dusted. And you could see little dust bunnies falling. And so I think that happens more than we think about in all settings. Absolutely. I, I really was thinking about my own house and how often my kids use the same dishcloth <laughs> to, to quote unquote clean. And your eight sides to that cloth made me just cringe because I yeah, that's not happening. So I, I do personally appreciate it. And I can't I can't even imagine the impact, you know, in a healthcare facility. It it's you know imperative. I don't think I mentioned this and I meant to. Um when you're cleaning your sink, um it's important again, top to bottom. Don't start at the drain and wipe up. Start mm -hmm. at the top of the sink and walk and wipe down. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Well, I, I do appreciate you sharing and the resources that you provided, as, as we mentioned, a few of the handouts um, that Nicole and um, Sherry referenced are included in the handouts tab. I will include them um, with to all attendees after today's event. Just a reminder, we'll provide a certificate of participation as well. Great Plains Quinn is an approved provider of CE credit with the North Dakota Board of Examiners for Nursing Home Administrators as well as the South Dakota Board of Nursing Facility Administrators. So that certificate that we provide um, can be provided to both of those entities for credit. And again, after today's session ends, attendees will be dropped off at our webinar evaluation. If you can take a minute to complete, a, complete that, it will help us plan and coordinate future events. Um, I want to thank Sherry and Nicole for uh, their time and information and all the work that you are both doing to improve infection control in our state. It is greatly appreciated and much needed. Uh, thank you again to everyone that joined. We appreciate your time and attention to today's session um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Have a great day.